Tea Party message to Washington that we're going to take our country back. We're just plain American people who are mad. We want to take our country back. I have got to run here, but just real quickly, I know I was at a town hall yesterday, and I, I really had to take some people to task. Very nice people, but they were using those buzzwords that I don't think people realize all the time, like real Americans or uh, give me back my America was one yeah. of the songs or take back America. It's like, where has... I don't, what do you mean by that? Well, when you stand up and you wax nostalgic and say things like, I want the country that the founders envisioned, when the country the founders envisioned was a formal system of white supremacy, excuse me if I find it a little hard to think that race is not perhaps playing a pretty big role. After one of the CNN appearances, I got an email from a woman who was a Tea Party supporter who was upset with my characterization of the Tea Party movement. She said that their calls to take the country back had nothing to do with race, that they were simply calling for a return to an era of low taxes and small government. When I replied to her, I asked her to give me a year, a year that epitomized in her mind this era of American history. Which year did she and the rest of the Tea Party want to return to? Her response was almost immediate and not very surprising. The year she chose, 1957. Leave it to Beaver. It's a year that many conservative white Americans hold dear, and not just because it's the year Leave it to Beaver premiered on television. Traditional America as we knew it is gone. Ward, well, June, let's, let's Wally, the, and the Beave, out of here. For many conservatives, that was the golden age of American history, a time when everything was in its place before all the struggles for equality and justice came along in the 60s and messed everything up. Do you remember how that felt? Do you remember what life was like? There's this sense that we've lost something precious, special, deeply American. This is about the systematic dismantling of this country. We are truly concerned about the the heartbeat of our country. They can have my country when they pry it from my cold, dead fingers. That people are overtaxed, overburdened, forced to hand over their hard-earned money to government bureaucrats so they can reward people for not working. I think the fact is, Americans are overtaxed. Government is spending too much, that we pay too high a taxes. I mean, everyone in America knows that Americans are overtaxed. Hello, we pay more taxes than we used to pay at every level. The only problem with that argument it's not even close to being true. The fact is, the top marginal tax rate in 2012 was 35%. A lot of people today think that rate is too high. But what was the rate in 1957? It was a whopping 91%, nearly three times higher than what it is today. There's too much involvement in the government. We can take care of ourselves. Our government is spending far too much, and our federal government is far too large, trying to do far too much. As for the size of government, in the pre-civil rights golden age, it wasn't small by any stretch of the imagination. The programs created by the New Deal, which disproportionately and almost exclusively benefited white people, weren't just massive in scale, they were massively popular. So why do we have this idea? that the pre-1960s was this bastion of American independence and freedom of small government and low taxes. And why do so many people today want to go back to that mythologized past? According to Martin Gillens, it has everything to do with our perception of who we think is benefiting from government programs today, especially those programs we like to call welfare. I'm Marty Gillens. I'm a political science professor at Princeton University. And uh, much of my research is on public attitudes towards anti-poverty policy and racial policy. The major work that I've done in that area uh, is a book called Why Americans Hate Welfare. Welfare spending now topping one trillion dollars a year. The American public tends to view welfare recipients as undeserving, uh, not really working hard uh, to support themselves, and view welfare recipients as disproportionately black. Both of those perceptions are at variance with what we know about the reality of welfare recipients. Even though the clear majority of people who benefit from government assistance are white, there's this perception that welfare and other government programs are somehow a black phenomenon. Why is this? Well, Gillen says it's because that's who we see on TV. Starting in 1965, media uh, portrayals of the poor have been disproportionately African American. Esther Williams, 21 years old, mother of a 19-month-old infant and a welfare client. 
if you look at either print news or television news coverage of poverty, you see far too many black faces relative to the true proportions of African Americans among the poor in this country. Alcinette Vargas, who has six children and a husband with a minimum wage job, reached her time limit in January without full-time work and was cut from welfare. So when we see stories about the poor, the poor are represented by people of color at a rate that is far greater than statistical reality. But it wasn't always that way. Before the mid-60s, media coverage of the poor consisted mostly of whites. It was the unemployed during the Depression, the people who fled the Dust Bowl, the rural poor in places like Appalachia. And the coverage of these poor white folks was overwhelmingly sympathetic and humanizing. As a result, Public support for social safety net programs was high from the period of the Great Depression all the way into the 1960s. But all of that changed. There are too many people taking advantage of the system. Why don't we spend some time developing a system that weeds out the cheaters? Once news coverage, media imagery, and political rhetoric started to equate poverty with people of color, we began to view the poor not as fellow Americans who were the hard luck victims of a system that had failed them, but instead as moochers who were abusing the system and undermining the nation's work ethic. And the sad irony is that there are millions of white people in this country who need those programs too, and now they're not there. Those programs have been cut to the bone because the beneficiaries have been seen as undesirable, undeserving others. How long will we have to pay for slavery? Man, I'm talking about the people on welfare trying to suck out the economy of this country, get a free house, a free car, free gasoline. They want it all because they think they deserve it. Well, in this country, you got to get a job. So don't, you know, and work. Did you get a tax cut this year from Barack Obama? I don't pay taxes. I'm, you, uh, I'm you don't disabled. pay taxes. I, I'm disabled from truck accident and veterans benefits. May I speak now? Yes, ma'am. Oh, I'm 90 years old, and I just wanted to ask the colored man, uh, why don't colored people, instead of seeing what we did to them, why don't they say what we did for them? Uh, they they talk about the, the slavery, but since then they have given them welfare, free medicine, free everything. Ma'am, I think this is more of a conversation about the relationship between the administration and uh, the people on Wall Street and not necessarily one that's based on race. Oh, oh, okay, I'm not a racist. I, that's, that was my comment. Thank you. None of this is by accident. The racial subtext that runs through a lot of the anti-government rhetoric is the result of an explicit political strategy that's been put to use by conservative politicians for decades. Here's how I would approach that issue as a, as a, as a statistician or a political scientist, or no, as a psychologist, which I'm not, is, is how abstract you handle the race. In a recently uncovered recording, the late Republican strategist Lee Atwater, one of the pioneers of race-based political appeals, was heard talking quite openly about how the strategy works. You start out in 1954 by saying nigger, nigger, nigger. By 1968, you can't say nigger, that hurts your backfire, so you say stuff like uh, force busing, states rights, and all that stuff. And you're getting so abstract now, you're talking about cutting taxes, and all of these things you're talking about are totally economic things, and the byproduct of them is blacks get hurt worse than white. The idea was for Republican politicians to speak in a kind of racial code designed to turn white working class voters against government programs, the very programs that they themselves had benefited from for years. The present welfare system has become a monstrous, consuming outrage. Government is not the solution to our problem Government is the problem. And this kind of thing runs right up to the present day. President Obama is the most effective food stamp president in American history. This is precisely the point historian John Bracey, a veteran of the civil rights movement, has been trying to make for years. What the ruling class in this country has successfully done is to label social programs as black programs, minority programs, and then you can kill it. I don't want to, to make black people's lives better by giving them somebody else's money. I want to give them the opportunity to go out and earn the money. You know, that's the most foundational thing in American life. I mean, that's Obamacare. Everything that is getting pushed through Congress, including this health care bill, are transforming America. And they are all driven by President Obama's thinking on one idea. 
reparations. Uh, virtually every normal kind of social program that would have kicked in in Europe in the 19th century, you know, in order to help working people, you know, survive under capitalism, we don't have. While the state's budget deficit has reached almost a half billion dollars now, the state's Medicaid program has announced more than $14 million is being cut to various providers throughout the state. There are people that won't expand Medicare. Like I just got back from Mississippi. They're debating expanding Medicare in Mississippi. They need every nickel and dime they can get in there from anybody. They should not question anybody. If Martians came and said, we're going to give you something, they should say, whatever it is, we'll take it because they need everything. They refuse. They have a political system that's still dysfunctional enough that they turn down aid for white people in Mississippi because black people get some too. This is how racism victimizes white people indirectly as well. American history is full of examples of white anxiety and resentment around race being used to undermine their own interest and their own well-being.